So welcome back to uh, our evening session. Our next, our next presenter is going to be Dr. Yol. Did I say that name right? Um, Dr. Yol is uh, presenting on human security as a framework for developing and assessing proposals for suitable peace in South Sudan. Um, he is an associate professor of physiology at St. John's University, Queens, New York. He obtained his PhD from Queens University in 2014. Uh, from 2017 to 18, he was a postdoctorate follower at Fordham University and joined the St. John's Physiology Department in 2019. He specializes in early modern physiology, uh, epistemology and history and physiology of science. He is an active uh, member of the North American Noel community and is deeply interested in finding and implementing avenues toward a sustainable peace that prioritizes. Oh, now I did. I can't even speak English anymore. <laughs> Human development and um, democratization within the region of South Sudan. Mr. Yolt, you are welcome. You do have 30 minutes for your speech. Let's try to keep time so we can get out of here on time. If you see me standing there, that means it's your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> stamping out corruption? Is that what we should be putting our energies on? Do these solutions address the underlying structural causes of our conflict, such that we can have a sustainable peace? I think these are serious questions that we have to ask ourselves. And can these solutions be applied with wide enough scope to ameliorate those identified problems? And is the solution that's itself to be applied, is it wide enough in scope to be, viable, to be a viable solution to the issue at hand. I think that, uh, I think that uh, the human security framework can help us with all these questions. Okay. And uh, let me just quote something from a uh, UN uh, website about human security. It states, as stated in the General Assembly Resolution 66-290, quote, 
Human security is an approach to assist member states in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of their people. And I think these are important. Livelihood and dignity of the peoples that we're concerned to talk about. The human security approach is considered by many to be an approach that, quote, is a proven analytical and planning framework that supports more comprehensive and preventive responses by the UN, and that cuts across sectors, developing contextually relevant solutions, and adopting partnerships to help realize a world free, of, uh, free from fear, want, and indignity. And I think it's important here for us to uh, focus on uh, contextually relevant solutions. What is the context? So we need to ask ourselves, is the context in South Sudan always the same? A country with a myriad of different ethnic groups, different worldviews, different languages, different ways of expressing and thinking about what it means to have a government. So it seems to me that the context is going to be different as we go from people to people. And I think we have to recognize that if we're to come up with any viable solution. So changing what, changes, changing what needs to be changed, the human security approach is a powerful one. And uh, as far as I can see, it has four, principal, uh, four principles of action principal pillars of action, I should say. The first is that we go from coordination to integration. Second is that we promote multi-stakeholder partnerships. The third, a focus on localization and the idea that no one, and the one here we're talking about, no ethnic group is left behind. Second, or rather the last one, prevention and resilience. And I think prevention and resilience um, underlies what we're trying to find, what we're looking for, and we're looking for a sustainable peace. Surely something that's a sustainable peace is something that's resilient, and is something that sees problems coming, uh, <coughs> coming from the future and then deals with it. So, the first one, from coordination to, uh, to integration, is the application of human security um, advances comprehensive responses that address the multi- dimensional causes and consequences of complex challenges. So the problems, the challenges that we face in South Sudan and the cause of these conflicts, they're not one-dimensional, they're multi-dimensional. So therefore, any solution, uh, any attempt to, to discuss or come up with a solution um, has to itself also be multi-dimensional. So as such, it calls for integrated action among a network of stakeholders, such as we're doing here, um, to ensure lasting responses to the most significant <coughs> deficits in peace. <coughs> Another um, key word there, development. Peace and development go hand in hand. Surely what we're looking for as peoples within that region is to catch up with the world. We are undeveloped. Our people are undeveloped. And that's something that ought not to be. So whatever uh, whatever solution will get the development of the peoples, that's something that we should be going for. Otherwise, we would not be speaking in good faith. Promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships. Human security draws together the expertise and resources of a wide range of actors uh, from the UN, other governments, private sector, civil society, and local communities. The local communities there is important. Because no people knows how to, uh, to better serve their interests than the people in question. Otherwise, it just becomes an outside imposition, a sort of paternalism that never fares well. Localization and leaving no one behind. So we have to recognize, when it comes to this pillar, uh, that the root causes and manifestations of challenges vary significantly across countries, of course, across communities. And human security promotes responses that are grounded in local realities. So here, uh, we have to be careful not to, not to push aside local realities. If a group of people says, look, we're suffering this, this is our reality, that has to be taken seriously. And it has to be uh, the center by which we look for a solution. Otherwise, uh, we end up having a South Sudan without the South Sudanese. So, last, Prevention and resilience. Prevention is a core objective of human security. It addresses the root causes of vulnerability, focuses attention on emerging risks, and emphasizes early action. And it strengthens local, capability, local capacities to build resilience 
and promote solutions that enhance social cohesion and advance respect for human rights and dignity. So, I want to reiterate that everything that I'm about to say hereafter, I take to be in, uh, to be in keeping uh, with the framework, with the human security framework. Uh, however jarring it might seem, human security is a pragmatic application for the human rights ideal. Oftentimes, we tout human rights as an ideal, but then do we, have to, do we ask ourselves, how do we apply it in people's everyday lives? What does it mean to have human rights? Okay, for instance, what does it mean to have human rights if I don't have, uh, if I don't have clean water, right? If I don't have uh, access to food, if I don't have uh, the freedom to build uh, my life around things that I hold very dear to, around my culture, around my people, around my worldview. So, there are three freedoms that human security is <laughs> Freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom to live a dignified life. So in seeking to address the challenges of finding sustainable solutions to the various conflicts in the region that, of South Sudan, we should take hold of this approach. So therefore it seems to me that we need to have human security as a framework for developing objectives for this and other discussions where people of goodwill seek to find solutions to the deplorable situation of the peoples of South Sudan. So I submit the following uh, points as guides. We should aim for the maximal development of the average person. That should be our aim. That, that tunes us to what kind of solutions are possible solutions or acceptable ones. Second, we should aim to assess what the goals of sustainable peace we are looking for are. What are the goals of the sustainable peace of the world? So, in keeping with the human security approach, I suggest the following goals for sustainable peace worthy of the name. Sustainable peace is really, uh, is really only possible when the average person has access to food, fresh water, and is free from fear, from debilitating want, and is free to live a life with dignity. Consequently, our aim should therefore be to erect whatever structures of whatever scale are necessary to procure these three freedoms. And if we're not willing to go that far, then we need to ask ourselves, what is the whole point of the entire edifice of civilization if it's not for in the service of life? If it's not in the service of acquiring these things? All of it should be in the service of life. I suggest that we think of South Sudan in this sense, not as a country, not as a political entity, but we think of it as a region. Because the problems certainly don't fit within these discrete political boundaries. So, as a region, not as a state, according to the conflicts in South Sudan, and there are many, um, these conflicts do not obey the confines of discrete political boundaries. Certainly not of South Sudan. Part of this comes from the fact that the various peoples, people groups, um, often straddle different political boundaries of neighboring states. So, any divide we make between a part of a people in South Sudan and another part of the same people in, say, Uganda or Ethiopia is sure to be an invidious one. It renders us unable to fully understand or predict neither the operations of the South Sudanese government and other regional powers, nor the operations and grievances of the many ethnic groups in that region. I suggest we acquire these three freedoms in the following way. Freedom from what can be achieved by enabling ethnic groups to be real stakeholders in their own economic future. Two, freedom from fear can be achieved by empowering peoples to exercise control, these various ethnic groups, over their own territories, thereby, uh, and work with them to protect their loved ones. Three, Freedom to live a dignified life can be achieved only if people are allowed and enabled to live according to the dictates of their culture and their worldviews. Any change that comes to the culture, even those that come from interaction with, other, uh, with, outs with those outside of their people, should have their origin in the people under consideration. Otherwise, again, it's an imposition. And people have a right to be 
and to be respected as the key players in the development of their culture, language, and social structure. So a kind of certain right of cultural inertia is a necessary one. Uh, and to deny it seems to me to be paramount to treating as passive, as passive objects or amorphous, um, or an amorphous mass of genetic material, people that ought to be considered active and equal members of the human family with their own contributions to make to that mosaic. So the remarks that I make in what is to follow are for the purpose of presenting a solution uh, based on the candid and sincere evaluation of the situations of the people in South Sudan through the preceding uh, human security approach. First, I want to ask, how did we get here? How did we get here as Africa? Allow me to say that, to, to my mind, many of the reasons why the situations in South Sudan, and indeed throughout much of Sub Saharan Africa, often seems to be intractable in many of these conflicts, is precisely our tendency as Africans to be coy about the reality of ethnicity. We tend to want to bury it more than any other group of people. Because we seem to think that somehow it's a, it's a defect of ours, but it's not. We seem to think of ethnicity as a kind of defect of our various ethnicities and their attendant claims as an impediment to progress. So as a result, we endeavor to well nigh banish discussion of it, or to reduce our ethnicities down to something smaller and presumably less important. So we refer to ourselves as tribes, and not as nations. Not as the nations that we are. To be sure, many stateless nations, but nations nonetheless. We must move away, I think, from this, from this uh, tendency to refer to Africans, African peoples, or so nations, as tribes. And I submit that the terminology is for many African peoples, if not, um, if not most, at best highly inaccurate and at worst demeaning. So, I'm not sure what sense uh, can be made out of the thought that a people, say, close to six, 60 million in number, such as the Yoruba, are a tribe where the Icelanders, a people with a population less than 400,000, is a nation. The Yoruba, a stateless nation, is a nation, not a tribe. So of course there are tribes in the Yoruba, Yoruba tribes. But here the term tribe should be used more in its original Latin meaning. In the Latin, tribus, or tribus, from whence uh, comes the English tribe, was a name for a voting bloc, a political division of the Roman people built around familial groupings. That's what tribe means. But then you have to be a tribe of a particular nation. And a nation speaks the same language, has the same kind of customs as a people. It's not a snap of the different peoples. That creates confusion. And of course, eventual conflict. So why, I submit, should the newer people, approximately five million in number, be a tribe and the Dutch a nation? If we insist on the use of inaccurate terminology, this will militate against accurate understanding, and that will hamper effective action. So the use of the term tribe is largely, I think, a holdover uh, from European racism that held that Africans had not and could not develop societies reaching the complexity of the nation. So of course, um, this view was not held by all Europeans and certainly not um, by many Europeans, of, by any Europeans of genuine intellectual integrity. Nevertheless, countervailing political interests led to the worldview being the dominant one, and it was inferred from this faulty premise that any assemblage of African peoples can be assembled into a nation. And we've run with that premise ever since. You know? And then when we run into the wall, we wonder, oh, there must be something wrong with us. So, um, this was a, so, uh, the map of, um, rather, yeah, this was undoubtedly one of the justifications for the division of African lands into arbitrarily drawn political divisions, the vast majority of whom are still, of which are still in existence today. The map of Africa has hardly changed from the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference on West Africa, despite the fact that the population density of Africa has only increased since then, and that Africa now has the fastest population growth curve of any part of the world. In particular, East Africa, out of Africa, has the highest number of young people. 
And so therefore the fastest growing demographic. This is taking some, and this is taking some time for Africa to get here. By some estimates, the population density that Europe had in the 1500s was only equaled by Africa in the 1970s. In stark contrast, the map of Europe has changed dramatically. More than that of Africa, given the relative size of the European continent in comparison to the African continent. Europe's landmass is approximately 3.9 million square miles, and yet contains about 42 to 44 countries, depending on how and which countries you count. Um, most of which are ethnically homogeneous nation states. Africa's landmass is approximately 11.7 million square miles and contains only 52 countries, the vast majority of which are massively ethnically heterogeneous and underdeveloped. So, we want to, we want to develop the people with no health care, little education, massive land masses, and then we say, well, why aren't their governments strong enough to handle a land mass like the Congo? Would it not be more sensible to cut these things up into smaller, more manageable bits that one can then control with the help of their partners? Regional and world partners? So, if Africa had the same density of states that Europe had, it would have more than three times the number of states it currently does. And it would still be room. The time of the Berlin Conference, 80% of, of the African continent was under the control of local powers, ruling according to various African civilizational political systems. The Berlin Conference divided the continent into a myriad of unnatural geometric political boundaries. These new boundaries clumped African ethnic groups that did not get along and that at many times had varying political and social philosophies. One scholar writes that the Berlin Conference was Africa's undoing more ways than one. The colonial powers superimposed their domains on the African continent. By the time independence returned to Africa in the 1950s, the realm had acquired a legacy of political fragmentation that could neither be eliminated nor made very satisfactory. So, but as daunting as it may seem, we must do Africa's undoing. And the way that we do this is we welcome the right of Africans to continue to rethink and to redraw their political boundaries until arrangements conducive to sustainable peace is found. If we're really serious about a sustainable peace in Africa, okay. in general, and in South Sudan in particular. I take the partition of South Sudan, in fact, as a step in this process. We are not at the end of the undoing of Africa's undoing. So I want to reiterate that the drawing of political borders, though, is not a message of division, but actually a message of unity. For instance, you do not get the modern European, uh, you don't get the modern EU without first having smaller, independent European nation states. Otherwise, the EU isn't possible. So why would we think that in another set of human beings, under the same conditions, that something else would arise? So I think we have to embrace divisions that unify and reject unities that divide. And if people think, well, you know, this has never been seen before, y'all. How is this to be possible? How would the international community deal with it? Well, let's not forget the Dayton Accords. The sort of undoing I'm speaking of has been done before. So we do well to remember the Dayton Accords of which the United States was part commenced November 1st, 1995, and concluded the 26th of November, 1995. And they occurred just outside Dayton, Ohio. These accords created a framework for a lasting, sustainable peace in the former Yugoslavia, ending a brutal four-year-long war that claimed the lives of over 250,000 people and caused more than 2 million people to flee their homes. These accords ended a conflict that was fought along ethnic lines, largely over territory. So it behooves me to point out that neither then Chief U.S. Peace Negotiator, Negotiator Richard Holbrook nor Warren Christopher 
who was the then U.S. Secretary of State, um, were ordered by the administration of Bill Clinton that the recognition of the independence of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of Croatia, and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was out of the question. They were not told that that was out of the question to get a sustainable peace. So why should that be out of the question now? Here, another set of human beings under the same conditions. So, indeed, the U.S. and other member states, other NATO member states, were guarantors of peace, later signed in Paris on December 14th of that year. As part of the accords, the signatories agreed to fully respect the equal sovereignty of one another and to settle disputes by peaceful means. And of course, peaceful dispute resolution is facilitated by the understanding that the sovereignty of one's own land cannot be abridged by another without consequence. <coughs> Otherwise, how can you be calm enough to trust another person? If you have no assurance that the sovereignty of your land, that the security of your peoples, is something that is of concern to you. So you'll always be on edge, always be mistrusting the other. How then do you have a sustainable peace? Mm -hmm. The 2013 genocide, for instance, of, of newer citizens by the government, uh, by government soldiers in Juba, which started off the civil war in South Sudan, was at least as brutal as anything that happened in the Yugoslavian War 31 years prior. The resulting war, lasting five years, claimed more than 400,000 lives, most of whom were civilians, and the majority of whom were civilians. The war caused more than 2.5 million people to flee their homes, to internally displace persons camps and refugee camps in neighboring countries. Like the Yugoslavian War, the South Sudanese War was fought largely along ethnic lines, and at least in, in, in at least as much as the South Sudanese government's military operations revealed. Like the Yugoslavian War, the South Sudanese War was fought over territory, and again, at least as far as the South Sudanese government's aims uh, clearly show, the South Sudanese government was, and is to a lesser extent, involved uh, in systematic land grabs of, say, um, of Nuer, Shuluk, and Equatorial lands and redistribution of them to the Dinka people. Sometimes this is done through the redrawing of internal political boundaries named administrative regions, by which administrative control of regions, including non Dinka lands, is given to the Dinka populations. Other times, it is accomplished by arming Dinka cattle herders and allowing them to violently seize Equatorian farmlands and driving rural Equatorian populations to the cities, thereby disenfranchising people who are largely subsistence farmers of their land. We've all seen it, we all know that this happens, so there's no gain in not stating it. Naturally, the state-sponsored violence of this sort is downplayed and it's chalked up to communal violence. All the, state's all the while, the state's policy of nation building through gradual ethnic cleansing rolls on unabated. So as far as I can see, there is no essential difference between suffering peoples of wartime uh, former Yugoslavia and the suffering peoples of South Sudan. So in the absence of any essential difference between the two sets of, of groups, why would we not avail ourselves of a solution that has borne a sustainable peace and even growing cooperation among ethnic groups who less than a half century ago were bitter enemies in Yugoslavia? Yes, the ethnic groups in South Sudan are black Africans and the ethnic groups in uh, former Yugoslavia are white. But the thought that that should be any difference, that should make a difference, is appalling. And on the face of it, no reason can be offered as to why cynicism about, about, uh, about more, the moral order of the international uh, community is not the most rational course of action. So, if some lives are more precious in the eyes of the international community than others, why not then believe that might determines right? Why not, as the ancient Greek political uh, thinker Thucydides held, uh, that we should hold in view the real sentiments of us both, since you know as well as we, we do that right as the world goes is only in question between equals in power while the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. Okay. Should we hold that view? Of course, it's a founding principle of the realist school of thought, but this is not an academic question. There's more at stake here. Consider that if this way of looking at things were the lens by which ordinary people in South Sudan looked at the world, and by extension, South Sudan, would this lessen the murders? Would this stamp out corruption? Would this eradicate ethnic cleansing? 
Would this foster inter-ethnic understanding? It seems to me that it would do the exact opposite. It would fuel a war of all against all in which martially capable peoples in South Sudan should defend what is theirs and seize what they can to the degree that they're able in direct contradiction to international norms. International norms that they've ever seen only broken by their enemies and by the state that they're part of to their destruction while those enemies of that state goes unpunished. And so we could give them no rational reason why they should not behave this way if we refuse to apply the most just and effective solution to conflicts of this sort. Partition of a political structure that we, through the instruction of history, know does not work. So if we're serious about sustainable peace, we must take serious partition, uh, seriously the partition of South Sudan, um, a country three times the size of Yugoslavia, into more manageable chunks. Okay? And so, um, lastly, I'll point out that uh, whether or not we say it ought to be done, there already are young people in various ethnic groups that are saying this is what must be done. The winds of change are sweeping through Africa again. For instance, your young people, those 22 to say 40, the largest demographic of the Nuer people, have decided and been pushing for Nuer independence in the last few years. And they see it as the only solution to this intractable problem. And the Nuer have always been staunchly independent. So in fact, uh, we already have this among, uh, among more young people pushing for independence, saying that this is, um, this is the only solution. Okay. And it doesn't stop at the Nur. You also see movements start to increase among Equatorian youth. And in discussions with some Shuluk youth saying, well, look, independence partition is the only way. So if we have this massive, cons if we have this great consensus between three of the largest regions. Would we bypass this consensus, three of the largest regions among young people, saying that, look, this is a, we would rather be a community of nations than one nation. And we have these smaller nations, more ethnically homogeneous, such that uh, any, uh, any nations, any, any larger states that wish to, um, to sponsor this sort of solution can then sponsor it. Every group of people knows best what's best for their development. So, um, I know my time's over, so I'll... Uh... Sorry to distract you, actually I wanted to... Um, you have a very interesting topic going on, I wish we have enough time to give you more time to keep talking, but we wanted to spice it up a little bit, because we have um, our audience online have been very patient with us, and they've been asking a lot of questions, so we actually have a question that is directed to you, so if you want to answer that, and then I'll give you one more minute to wrap up, and then we'll be good, even though you kept ignoring me. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, I think you guys realize that we have participants online, so they are following uh, carefully, and this particular individual he is called Lezai, and he is asking you two questions. I think he heard you talking about freedom. Yeah. So the first question, um, let me just put it up here. He said, how can international community help people under oppressed by their government to obtain this kind of freedom as they have been denied by the government? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is, if the government has no roadmap for these freedoms, what measures will be taken by the international community to ensure these freedoms at least are exercised by civilians? So those are the two questions by the person from all. Okay. Great. So there's a uh, there's a framework in international relations called remedial, uh, remedial succession. Right? And remedial succession is a framework that's been offered um, by a number of academics. Uh, and it's supposed to be a framework that gives room for the international community to, ensure, to, uh, to work with, um, with an ethnic group, with a nation that has unilaterally declared independence. Okay? So the concern has often been that if everybody just declares unilaterally that they're going to be independent, is there going to be a lot of chaos? Right? 
Uh, but then on the other hand, it said, so what, do we deny people their God-given right to declare independence? So, of course, this seems to be a middle, a middle ground. We say, well, uh, there can be international partners interested in the development of people. And if they're interested in the development of people, then we can have something like the Dayton Accords. Okay. A government um, that, that attacks its own people forfeits the right uh, to, be, to, to be free from partition. So that's to say, if a government that's supposed to provide protection for its people turns around and destroys these people, why should it be considered legitimate any longer? Should, I mean, after all, wasn't these United States formed along those lines? We declare these, you know, these to be self-evident, all the country created equal. And, you know, and they have the right to liber life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's for the purpose of ensuring these rights that governments are, uh, are established among, uh, among human beings. And that when a government goes against these, uh, these purposes, it's the, it's the right, nay, the, the duty of the people who are suffering to remove such a government and to establish for themselves governments and structures that they see as best able to procure their, uh, their, their good. So a government such as um, the, the government of, uh, government of uh, the, you know, the English kingdom, right, at the time, right? forfeited the right to not be partitioned. Why? Because it killed its people. So it, has, it, has, it cannot say, well look, I should be protected from partition. Otherwise, uh, it's unclear what we're doing. So there is a route for, uh, for the international community um, to be able to, 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 to help um, people, uh, people groups to get these freedoms. But the core idea is that these freedoms, particularly the freedom to uh, to, to live a dignified life are freedoms that, that have to be given the people. They don't need so much given them, they have to be allowed to exercise them. And how do, you, how do they exercise them other than having you know, sovereignty over their, their political uh, boundaries? And I know, when people mention sovereignty, we think, okay, well, nation states, uh, partition and so forth, right? As if these things are sacrosanct. They are not sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, much of the world now is talking about, well, is it the end of the nation state? Some people will say, well, the nation, the nation state is the end of the nation state because now it's going to move away from these multinational uh, um, you know, organizations, these regional bodies such as the EU and so forth. Others say, no, no, it's going to move away for city states because they're more effective, they're more, uh, they're more effective and so forth, right? So uh, if no one else thinks that, um, that these political boundaries, nation states and so forth, um, are, are sacrosanct, why are we as Africans beholding to keeping a structure that's not suitable for us? Right? Um, these political structures are made for people, not people for political structures. So therefore, um, why shouldn't we be free to say, well, look, we need to create different structures. If there are ethnic groups of people who get along and say, hey, we can form a, a multi-ethnic state, well, power to them, why not? Belgium is one such state. If there are other groups of people who say, well, look, I think it's best if we form our own state, then why should they be denied that right? Okay, so, um, so, so I think that, I hope that answers uh, both questions. Yeah, uh, I think it's fine on the line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he, and he, he said, he did not say anything yet, but I accept that question is the same thing. So if you like from there, I hope you heard the, the answer and you can respond by typing there. Thank you. If you have another question, you can just shoot it forward and you can always forward it to the presenter. And this is not meant to be a punishment for you since you took all your time. But um, it's amazing how when we combine philosophy and politics, then it becomes an interesting subject where it touches people's souls in a different way. If it's only philosophy, then you go, ah, they're messing up with my brain. So on that note, two more people have urgently burning questions that they want to forward to you. Please make it short. And the take here is that um, we're going to hold you hostage to invite you for our next conference so we can follow up on this. But let's hear the questions and you try to answer it. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank you, Brother Yul, 
for your elegant uh, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, the issues that you have raised are really pertinent and relevant, not only to us as Africans, but also uh, to the people of South Sudan. Uh, because the voices that are calling for suppression now in our country, the voices are growing louder. Uh, as you put it correctly, be it in Upper Nile, uh, be it in Equatoria, and so forth. And uh, these voices cannot be denied. Uh, because if we deny such voices, we will be making the same mistakes the Northern Sudanese did. Uh, when South Sudanese were demanding for federation, and uh, those of Ankri Jadir were asking for that in the 1950s, uh, Abud, when he came in and took, and took power through military coup, he said there is no federation for one nation. Federation is suppression, which means he doesn't believe in federation. So you could see the demands of the people of South Sudan from federation that had been denied to them in the 50s, and now South Sudan has become an independent state. Because the northerners decided to put their heads in the sun, and saying that the unity of Sudan uh, is, is a holy cow. No one should talk about it. Mm. I understand the argument that you're putting forth, that indeed the African borders, the colonial borders, were just inherited by us, uh, these few uh, you know, uh, European made in 1884 in Berlin over a, a glass of whiskey and decided to divide the whole continent. You know, give them even names. Uh, for example, you know, you have uh, Guinea-Bissau, you have whatever. Some of the countries, Cameroon. 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 Cameroon is called what? Cameroon is actually what? Uh, Shrimps or something like that. You know, and they still call themselves Shrimps. You know, uh, but the reality is, should we really continue sticking to the uh, founding fathers' concept of just keeping the African integrity and colonial borders? Or we have to think what you're saying, that what is it? After all, you rule as a nation, or Rome is a nation. Mm -hmm. What makes, for example, Norway to be a state, or to be able to be a country, and not the Romans, for example. Now, coming to South Sudan, my question to you. I understand what you're saying, that the government has failed to make South Sudan an attractive nation. We're I mean, not yet a nation. South Sudan is a geographical fiction, to be honest with you. Mm. You know, we are just a state, because nation means we have to sign a social contract through a constitution where all the various nations, or you call them, the North tribes, agree that this is the model we want for South Sudan. We have not done yet. We have not done that yet for the last 10 years. So you're right that people have the right to say, look, we are not happy with this kind of unity. But rather than just throwing it away, the union of South Sudan at this critical stage of our history, the only thing if we adopt a federal system where we have uh, power, is uh, shared, the economical power is power and, uh, and, and economical power is shared between the free freeze, which is the state and the center, where there's a complete power given to the state, the federal, the federal, federal level, and you leave the center with only the coordinating you know, role like this, for example, DC, and leave each and every state to determine their own fate. There's the economical policies, their you know, peace and security, for example, the police has to be local. Do you think that could actually address the economical, social, and, 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 and political fears of, let's say, the other nation within South Sudan. Or even if it doesn't work, do you think also we could, we could try the Swiss confederal system, you know, where the people could, could, could actually live in a federal state or a confederal state, you know, and having a rotational president within the federal region or whatever, we confederate that we may agree on, rather than just throwing everything away and going for total suppression of the tribes. Thank you. So, I guess one of the first things I'll say is that... Um, Can uh, we take the second question, so you answer both of them at the same time? Sure. Uh, ambassador always have lecturing questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go ahead and have our brother, Lumari, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, Thank you. Um, again, thank you for your uh, well-presented uh, lectures. I just have a simple question based on uh, the knowledge of the state that we have, or the failed state that we have as South Sudan. I've uh, been listening to you keenly, and one thing that I picked, I'm, not, I'm going to disregard the whole issue to do with the Africa, but just I want to now it to South Sudan and especially, especially the three regions that we have. Uh, one of the mistakes that I hear a lot that people 
do make when they present. They have categorized uh, the three regions into tribes, where one would say, for example, Upper Nile. And there are so many tribes there. And then you come to Kotoria, you categorize Kotoria as a tribe, uh, demanding for their own movement or the health issues. That's just a, it's just a remarkable thing that I always catch from people. Now, my question is by making such a Samson or misinformation, don't you think that actually elevates the fact that people decided to look into themselves as not one group in the failed state like Thousand? That's just my question. Okay, so I think I'll answer that question first. Uh, nowhere in my presentation, if I assume, um, or talk about the Upper Nile region, because I think that those distinctions um, are arbitrary. Uh, so what I said, uh, when I said the, I, I said the Shunuk, I said the Equatorians, and I said the Nur, right? Uh, I did not say the Upper Nile region, because of course, many different nations, not just tribes, live in the Upper Nile region. Uh, and I think that there is a tendency for us to talk about um, some of the major ethnic groups, right? Meanwhile, there are smaller ethnic groups that are, as we speak, are going extinct, say the Purti people, right? And so uh, I think that our, our concern should be, uh, well, look, we have to look at each group of people as a particular group of people, as they are. And so therefore, um, I don't agree that we should refer to them as tribes. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we refer to the Nur as a tribe, right, then what do we call the Long Nur? What do we call the, uh, the, the, the what do we call the, um, the, the Daigyo, right? The Bumla, etc. right? These are all tribes of a larger Nur nation, okay? You can even see that there are even uh, uh, differences in dialect among them, okay? So that's what we mean by a nation, if there's to be any, uh, if there's to be federalism, that federalism has to happen within a nation. Okay, so, so federalism is not something that we're supposed to have across nations, but right? it's supposed to be something that's, uh, that's supposed to happen within a nation. Otherwise, um, what sort of federal government is there between the U.S. and Mexico? Right. So, so that's, that's what I think, or, or between uh, you know the, uh, the, the the Dutch and the, the Romanians. I mean, uh, one, one we think of that is like what well, about well, ridiculous, right? Why is it acceptable when it comes to uh, when it comes to the people groups in South Sudan? A land has about 30,000 square miles uh, bigger than France. So we're not talking about small chunks of land, we're talking about huge chunks of land, large groups of people. Um, and it's, it's demeaning. And it creates, it makes us think that their problems are bigger than they are. We think of them as tribal conflicts, when really they're wars of nations against nations. And so if we think that they're small things, we might think that, you know, after all, we don't have to, it's not drastic, we don't need a drastic solution. Right? Um, but I tend to think that uh, a lot of drastic things are happening. So, um, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the question of whether or not, um, you know, at this moment in our history, for instance, right? Uh, I think that we have to ask ourselves this, right? If, uh, if you were taking a math exam uh, and you realized, oh boy, you know, I, uh, I added where I should have subtracted. Um, do you continue on with the rest of the exam and then say, uh, I'll come back to it um, an hour later? No, you would fix it right away. So likewise, uh, what we say at this crucial moment in our history, that seems to presuppose that uh, South Sudan is something that we all want and should. But that's to beg the question. Uh, the very question here is whether or not um, something like South Sudan is something that should exist. So you mentioned before, you know, they gave them all these sorts of names and so forth, right? And, uh, and we got the name, you know, Sudan or South Sudan, uh, which, you know, essentially means the southern part of the land of blacks. Oh, but I like to think that there's more to me than my skin color, right? So, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, the blacks, just as the whites, have many different uh, ethnic groups, uh, many different civilizational streets. Why should those not be respected? Why should, uh, why should those, like, modes of life, uh, why should, should they not be allowed to develop their cultures, right? Um, isn't that something that's... Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a richness for us. And I think that, uh, so we have to ask ourselves, should South Sudan be something that, uh, that's required? And also too, if we say that, well look, um, there has to be something like South Sudan, we have to have some sort of federal government, because it's that federal government that's going to, to enable development. How? 
Is development not better reached if each group of people develop themselves? Uh, in the U.S. here, sometimes people argue that, uh, that, look, California is too big. It's a logistical nightmare to try and, uh, try and run California. Right? Why? Because you've got North California, Central California, Southern California. Right? And yet, if you, go to, uh, if you go to places in Southern California, that's the highest number, like Riverside, for instance, the highest number of, uh, of PhDs per capita in the world. So, a uh, place, uh, a very wealthy state, in the wealthiest country in the world, with the highest number of PhDs. And they say that California is a logistical problem. And yet we would say that don't forget, um, you know, a country that the, 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 the literature, the illiteracy is are high. Child mortality, infrastructure, near non-existent. And we would think that, that we've got to take the whole thing at once, rather does it seem to be more sensible to allow each group of people to fix uh, and, and to deal with their, uh, with their, with their problems? Right? Um, and the whole land is resources. There's hardly any group of people that doesn't have any resources. Okay, so um, our, it seems it strikes a paternalism to suggest that, uh, um, that each group of people cannot handle their own, uh, uh, cannot handle their own development. I like to think that um, among all the nations in every quarter, that there are capable people that know exactly what they're doing. I like to think the same thing in the country. That's what happened, right? And so, um, why not allow them that? They'll be better able to develop. And then we'll have the region as a whole developed. But we'll never be able to do it once. Because if you do that, then how do you prevent the, the attendant ills of ethnic economy? Which you see in every single, uh, in every single state <coughs> in Africa, that's massively heterogeneous, and we know that uh, that heterogeneity in developing states, uh, heterogeneity tracks negatively with democratization. It tracks negatively with GDP per capita. It tracks negatively with corruption. So the more heterogeneous the state you have, the more corruption you're going to have, the more. Uh, uh, the, the more, um, you know, the, the, the lower your GDP is going to be, um, the, the, the lower your democratization uh, index is going to be. And these are things that are proven across the board. Um, so why would, we, why would we do that when we just trust each people to form their own federal system, right? Um, I like to think that the Equatorians could form federal systems for the nations of Equatoria better than the central one in which the Noer, the Kuti, the Shunus are allowed and to have a say. I'm not sure why that was not at all. But I think this is just the most rational solution. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, it's not going to be easy, but the question is, uh, why would it not be easy? Who here would have rejected that? Who here says, no, I wish to deny some group of people their right. Um, who, who's going to raise their hand? What? All right? You would be the one who would deny all these groups of people the dignity to create their own uh, structures. <laughs> I didn't say majority of them. You said majority of I said majority of young people. Well, they are majority of people. By majority of young people. It doesn't mean that there isn't one. <laughs> Now we're talking, I wish we could add a third day to this conference, then we will have enough time to do that. Now I have, uh... sorry Uncle, we already passed the time, because I think uh, we have one presenter over there that is been waiting patiently to, um, to come present to us, and then we still have the panel, which we are running into their time, and um, we have to get out of here on time. But Dr. No? No? I've had you. You. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if it was your plan from all of this morning to steal the show, but you did steal the show. And, but it, 
it's for a good cause. It's for a good cause. I, I like your topic. I like the line of thinking. I think Ambassador um, Emmanuel here will be your best buddy. He is the champion on federalism. So I think your topic or your line of thinking can be cousins with federalism. And if we can sell it to our young people, we can overdo that tribalism that is keeping us down and we can become one nation and solve our problems. But thank you, let's keep this conversation going. what is drastic. Anything that removes those can never be drastic in the loss of life. Once someone's gone, they're gone. So whatever is necessary to prevent that, it's not drastic at all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Our next presenter is Craig Soli, and he's the director at Care of Creation Kenya. Um, let's give him uh, an applause when he comes from here. Oh, one minute. Oh, sorry. We're going to have the next presenter get ready. We are running out of time. So, um, we can try to get out of here on time because we have an early start tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and share with you. I have been to South Sudan twice, uh, in Juba, and went uh, to Western, just a few hours west of Juba. And when I live and work in Kenya, and I believe that the message I have for you today is really tailored towards the average, everyday South Sudanese. And particularly for the women of South Sudan. Because I know that the majority of the food grown in South Sudan is done by women. The same is true. The same is true in Uganda, where I lived when I was this tall, and the same is true in, I think, in Ethiopia, when I was this tall. <laughs> anyway, I lived in uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia. <clears throat> and as I begin, I'm going to be kind of taking a, a kind of a thread that Dr. Osborne talked about, a, a Christian worldview, and I'm going to talk about a Christian worldview in the context of farming. And before I get into my presentation, I often forget this, but if you are interested in what I have to say tonight, I have a book um, that says, uh, Farming That Brings Glory to God and Hope to the Hungry. It's got biblical principles of why we should be excellent stewards as farmers. And I've also got some brochures. So if you would like a book, I have a few available, and you're free to come and get them uh, afterwards. So um, I'm going to go back and uh, let's see. The title of my presentation is Biblically Based Creation Stewardship and Farming God's Way. Now I have two questions that I want you to write down on your notes. Who, who was the first farmer? That's question number one. Who was the first farmer? 